welcome and thank you for joining us for this Time to Change In Conversation event as part of our programme to mark Mental Health Awareness Week. I'm Tony and I'll be talking to Sarah about her experiences. We'll particularly focus on kindness as that's this year's theme for Mental Health Awareness Week and on stigma as that's what we're contending with through Time to Change. Time to Change is a mental health campaign in England with the objective of reducing mental health related stigma and discrimination. We're part of the Time to Change Kingston hub and we try to change and reduce stigma locally in Kingston. This is a virtual lockdown alternative to the Living Library events where members of the public have the opportunity to speak to those with lived experience of mental health issues. So just to start with a general health warning, we'll be talking about serious and sensitive topics and as we don't know your mental health background or how you're feeling at the moment, we need you to know that we're going to be as open and as honest as we can about our mental health experiences and we don't quite know where the conversation is going to go. So that means we need you to be very aware of your own personal vulnerability and we need you to pay attention to how you're feeling. And if at any point you start to feel anxious or distressed by what you hear, then please do log out or take a break for as long as you need. You can rejoin at any time should you feel ready. If you need support, you can call the Samaritans on 116 123, or you can text SHOUT, S-H-O-U-T, to 85258, or you can look for local mental health services in Kingston through the link that's gonna be posted in the chat. There's lots of help and support out there, so just look after yourselves and reach out if you need to. This meeting will be recorded and made available through our online living library on YouTube and will be linked to on social media. The link to the online living library will be posted in the chat. Because we're all on Zoom, the video will mostly feature myself and Sarah, but may feature images of you at the beginning and at the end of the event. If you don't want to feature in the video, please turn your video off. You might want to do that now. To keep the meeting running smoothly for everyone, I'd ask you that you keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the meeting and use the chat function for comments and questions. This can be found at the bottom of the screen where you'll find a little box where it says chat. Click on that and it will open up chat where you can send a message to everyone. This will be monitored throughout the meeting and we'll address any questions towards the end. Got that? So, Sarah, hello. Hello. Oh, you okay? I'm good, thank you. Are good. you? Yeah, yeah, me too. So, can you tell us briefly what mental health condition you have and what it's like to live with it on a daily basis? Yes, of course. So, I have anxiety and I have um, post-traumatic stress disorder which is PTSD. I've had anxiety since the age of 11 um, and I'm 24 now so it's been over half my life and I also then developed PTSD from two separate trauma events, one when I was in my late teens and one when I was in my early 20s. So living daily with PTSD and anxiety is quite interesting because a lot of the times they tend to overlap with each other. Um, PTSD is um, a type of anxiety disorder, um, although they are, they, can't, they are separate as well. Um, so I norm, ev normally on a day to day, I am, I'm, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm you know, my normal self. Um, however, sometimes triggers surface and sometimes these triggers surface without warning. Um, and sometimes they surface with warning. Um, and over the years, I've managed to develop um, healthy coping mechanisms to deal with these triggers. Because even though the trauma happened, um, well, my most recent one happened about over two years ago now. And even though it happened over two years ago, you know, when these triggers 
surface, they can still be very distressing. Um, I'm managing them a lot better than I was at the beginning um, with coping mechanisms that I've learned over time. Um, and also, you know, I'm, I'm learning to open up to people as well, which is just so valuable. Um, it's always been a struggle to open up to people, even my close friends, um, even when they knew that something was going on, it was still getting past that initial step of opening up to someone, which was difficult. But I'm, you know, I think the more you do it, the more you're able to do it without hesitation. Um, so that, you know, over time, it's just developed easier, I suppose. Um, and also you're building that trust with those people too, which is just invaluable. Um, I think my darkest point for my PTSD was when I was in my final year at university, which is when the trauma happened, the second trauma. And yeah, it was, it was difficult for many reasons. It was difficult because I was in my final year at uni um, and that was the only year that counted for my degree. So I had that stress alone, you know, with finishing my projects and, you know, getting a good grade because I had worked so hard and, you know, I want to get a good grade. Um, and then suddenly a trauma happened and it really shook me to my core, really. You know, it really, it was so distressing. Um, and it was, it was difficult to concentrate 100% with my work. Um, so, yeah, so some of the struggles were the flashbacks that surfaced, you know, I, the flashbacks were pretty much every night, you know, they were intense. It was every single day, you know, and it builds up. It, they, most of the time they surfaced when I had um, my dreams. Well, I suppose they were more nightmares really than dreams. Um, sometimes they also happened when I was awake as well, but the most common ones were when I was asleep. And um, that was really difficult because, you know, I have no control over these things that I'm picturing in my head. Um, they were very graphic. They were very real. They felt really real. Um, and I would wake up the next morning and I would just be in absolutely shock that my mind could conjure up such graphic imagery. Um, you know, sometimes I would lay in my bed for an hour after these nightmares because I just, I was just in, and I was just in a state of shock. I couldn't move. Um, I couldn't think of anything else apart from what I had just imagined. And, you know, if you're experiencing that every night and then you're stuck in your bed for an hour, you know, that's going to affect you getting to uni. Um, and it really affected my, my um, motivation, my concentration um, and my mood. Um, and also I was late for my lessons as well. So, you know, the teachers quickly picked up on that. Um, and yeah, I was also suffering from hypervigilance all the time, which for people who don't know what that is, it's a constant state of alertness, which is where the anxiety comes into play. Um, so, you know, I was experiencing that 24 seven, basically, even if I was just in my room where it's a safe place. Um, yeah, I was still constantly on alert and I just couldn't ever really settle myself physically and mentally. I think it's important to know that even though, you know, we're talking about mental health conditions and mental health illnesses and it's all in the mind, it's, it plays a big part on your physical body as well. You know, I was constantly, um, I was constantly um, tight in my body. Um, my mind was racing constantly. I could never settle my mind, which then made me really tired and exhausted. Um, so that was, it was really difficult to um, deal with and, I was, I was lucky to be um, in counselling at the time through my university. Um, they were my, my, well, she was actually a therapist. She was, she was amazing. Um, I'm really glad I had her at the time because when the trauma happened, I was very much in denial about what happened. You know, I wasn't, um, I wasn't for any part of me wanting to accept that it even happened. You know, my, my brain was basically in an absolute state of denial when, but it was strange because my body knew something had happened, um, but my brain couldn't process it. They, it couldn't accept it. 
Um, so having a therapist at that time was really helpful um, for me because she was slowly showing me ways to, um, you know, come to terms with it and just um, even just contemplating it in my mind. Um, and yeah, so that was that was a very roller coaster up and down of emotions at that time as well, um, because you know I was, you know, it takes time to process this kind of thing, and it also takes time to process the acceptance of what had happened, um, and also trying to deal with it on a daily basis as well. You know, I was I was in London, so I was on the tube a lot, and being in a crowded place full on made me go into a panic attack and sometimes I'd have to just leave and get off the tube and um you know not be around people because it was then starting to trigger these flashbacks of what had happened to me and if someone brushed it against me on the tube it would make me really tight and then make me go into the hypervigilance so having that person there to talk to um and to explain what happened and to be in a safe space a safe environment and know that there's no judgment um was so important and I was slowly opening up to my friends as well at the time. Um, and they were, they were on my course as well um, at university. So they knew the pressure I was under for my work. They were under similar pressure too. Um, but to have them there, um, to slowly open up to them. I mean, I'm not going to lie. It was, really, it was really difficult to open up to them, even though they were such great friends, um, making that initial step to just say it from my mouth what happened and then also trust that they're gonna be sympathetic and um be understanding and not judgment like the prejudgment that a lot of people face when they talk about their mental health um it was so um it was like a weight had been lifted when i told them and they were there to support me and they knew that you know sometimes when i wasn't at uni there was a reason why i wasn't and i was struggling and and, you know, sometimes they would call me up and ask me if I was okay or, you know, ask me if they wanted to, if I wanted them to come around and just talk to me and sit with me and um, just feel like I'm not alone. Like it was just so important. Um, so that was about two years ago. Um, and, you know, those flashbacks were really intense and the hypervigilance and the night terrors. Um, so now, um, two years on, um, I'm, I'm doing a lot better, um, but like I said before, you know, that flashbacks still surface and sometimes they surface without warning and I've learned certain ways to deal with it. Um, and I've, I've kind of come to terms, well, I'm coming to terms with the fact that, um, you know, it might never go away, it might always be there. And by not fighting it, by accepting it and by allowing it to come in when it is going to, um, makes the process a lot more calmer and softer and gentle for me you know I'm not fighting against the PTSD or the anxiety or the flashbacks you know I'm letting it happen um and you know it's it's very painful but by not fighting it it makes it um makes the process less um distressing I suppose you know and acceptance um, acceptance, acceptance exactly yeah, yeah. accepting it sounds like a, a terrifying and exhausting experience that you've been through. Yeah, it was exhausting. Um, and I, I suppose when you're in the thick of it, you don't realise how exhausting it is. For me anyway, um, you know, after I finished my degree um, over the summer holidays, I just like, I just slept constantly. I mean, of course I slept because of all the work, but the mental um, exhaustion that it plays on you just kind of like surfaces on your physical body um, and you know you've got to be kind to yourself of any mental health condition or any sort form of stress or trauma it's you've got to be gentle and um, you know you eventually you know you have to let that come out and let yourself experience it because you know we can only take so much as human beings oh, yeah. you, you mentioned um, some diagnoses at the top of the, of the what, what you said. Um, what what do you think the diagnosis or diagnoses mean to you? Um, so for me personally, um, when I um, had been diagnosed or when you know people had explained what it is, um, it made me feel. I know I know it's a very controversial topic because some people like to be 
um, like to have a label as it were, I suppose label isn't the great term for it, but also some people don't like it, some people like it. But I, I personally felt um, a sense of relief. Um, I felt like, okay, this is what it is. This isn't defining who I am. Um, it's a part of me. It's not the whole part of who I am. Um, and it really helped me understand what was going on. Um, it made me realize like, okay, so I have this condition. There are other people who have it too. And they're, they're doing great things with their life. You know, how are they doing it? What are they doing? It? How can I implement that into my life? So it was really, yeah, it was this big sense of relief for me. I'm really glad that I, um, you know, had been either diagnosed or been taught, told what it is. So then I can move forward with it. Um, and work with it instead of working against it. Um, and I know when I had my first trauma at um, college, I, I didn't understand anything that was going on. Um, I didn't understand it was PTSD. No one told me it was. I didn't even know what PTSD was. I was also experiencing psychosis um, from the trauma. And again, I didn't know that what that was. And by not knowing what it is, it makes me feel so much more alone. It makes me feel like I'm going crazy. Um, it makes me scared um, and all of those um, intense feelings and thoughts and emotions um, then makes me not want to talk about it because I'm, I'm, I feel that shame, I feel that guilt, I feel that embarrassment and you know if, if you're not talking about it then we can only cope with it for so long. Mm -hmm. So am I hearing that it, it had a, a sense of de demystifying what your experience was, and if you were language to what you talk about it. Yeah, completely. Um, it, yeah, I think um, I do feel like um, talking is like the best form of therapy. So if you're able to talk about it to other people, then it's just great. And, and, and what, what was square one for you? What, what, what was the first opportunity for you to? open up and 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 how did you how did you do that i'm sorry you just broke up a little bit i didn't hear what you said sorry so I, I was interested in um the, the opening up process had to start somewhere and that must have been really difficult so i was wondering what square one was what 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 enabled you to reach out to someone oh um if you if you feel you can share that i don't want you to share anything that makes you feel uncomfortable or, 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 or that it's too difficult of course no of course yeah thank you um i think yeah I, I suppose making that first initial step of opening up is is really really hard um and i i really did struggle you know um i think um for that incident when i was at uni to open up to someone it, it definitely took um, a lot of um, thoughts of like how to say it and what to say and how much to say and you know um, are they going to judge me or you know I was really nervous about that or you know or are they just going to say nothing you know like so many different scenarios that go around in your head um, but I think I, I just got to a point where I was like oh, I'm just going to explode you know like I just need to say it to someone um, and my I've had previous um, experience with counselors and therapists in the past where I've been able to open up to them. So, uh, and I, I, I think I got to a point where I was like, you know, well, I, you know, having that kind of friendship and stuff, you know, we, you do naturally talk to people about things. And I knew, I knew that the people I was opening up to, I knew that they were going to be some, there was going to be some form of sympathy. So I was definitely very careful about who I open up to. And I still am, you know, I think everyone is conscious about who they're opening up to. You know, you have to um, think about, you know, are they going to um, feed some form of sympathy or empathy towards you? Um, um, but I'm not going to lie, I'm in that first initial stage of just opening up and saying it from your mouth and it's also admitting to yourself that something has happened as well, you know, admitting that this terrible thing has happened and that you are struggling and you need help. It's that admit acceptance to yourself um, comes out when you're saying it to someone else. And, but, you know, when I did it, I, I honestly felt like this massive weight had been lifted off of me. Um, and it was just 
so so valuable um and I admit you know still I'm I don't actually uh, open up to people when I'm really in that deep um struggle you know anxiety ridden day um it takes a lot of courage to do that um so I always applaud anybody who's able to open up to anybody about their experience because you know it's such a um it's such a personal thing you know and there's no right or wrong way of um opening up to someone you know you've you've got to do what's best for you at the end of the day you know um yeah so so choosing the the, the right empathetic person who's not going to be judgmental exactly is, is, is really important yeah yeah um so if i given that we're times change and we talk about stigma if i kind of turn that on its head and ask you about stigma are you conscious of stigma and have there been circumstances where the, the, this has particularly happened yeah i mean i i mean i do talk about my men i suppose in the last like four or five months i've spoken about my mental health quite a lot but i do still feel like i said i, I don't open up to just anybody you know i still feel like there is that stigma um completely completely um and yeah I've, I've faced a lot of stigma growing up um when I was in my teenage years and then I also f saw it firsthand from family members who were going through their mental health struggles um and I saw the stigma that they were faced by just public people that they didn't know you know like on the streets um and even you know in educational settings and workplace you know I I, I was bullied a lot when I was in secondary school um, so there was that initial um, boundary automatically of not even wanting to open up to people um, and I think with stigma there's a lot you know when there's the stigma it means that there's the lack of education or the lack of um, understanding um, and the ignorance involved um, and yeah I think it was it was a real struggle um, for me to initially open up about my first ever incident when I was um, when I was in secondary school, um, and I um, I overdosed basically, um, and then I managed to start getting help with counselling and therapy. Um, but I just feel like if there wasn't that stigma and shame attached to what I was going through. I, I would have hoped that I wouldn't have had to get to that point to then cry out for help, you know? And um, I think it's, it's understanding like, why are we not wanting to talk about it? You know, what is, what is that barrier that's being faced? Um, and then tackle that onwards. I, I do feel like um, educational settings anyway for teenagers, it needs to be, um, the dialogue needs to be constantly there for everybody because just because you're not, Hearing about it doesn't mean it's not there. Um, what are you? What are your thoughts on it? I was interested that you, uh, you seeing other people being stigmatised had a kind of collateral effect on on you. So, you know, the the, the, the having a stigmatising culture doesn't just seem to impact the people who are targeted by the stigma, but that the, the other people can receive stigma. In, in, in the wash of that of that stigma, it, it makes it quite a quite a powerful and poisonous um, uh, quality, doesn't it? Stigma was, was yes. my reaction, I think. Yeah, um, I I completely agree. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't affect just that person; it affects the wider audience. Um, yeah, it's and yeah, I think I think that is one of the main barriers of why people can talk about what they're going through is because of the stigma and um i do hope with us being time to change champions we can um you know start that conversation and really truly try and end stigma for mental health yeah. because it is that first barrier and if they didn't have that if you wouldn't have that stigma then you know maybe people wouldn't need to go to such drastic and um serious lengths to seek that help yeah. oh yes to that i mean we do intend to talk about uh, why we think society uh, finds it difficult to uh, uh, seek and, and admit to our, ourselves that we that we need help. So it, it sounds like this would be a good time to 
to do that now, perhaps you know, change the order of what, of what we're going to approach. As we yeah, of course. <laughs> I mean, for me, there's something about the, the values that are abroad in our society, which is, is quite competitive, you know, um, as well as being a good consumer that seems to be rewarded. You're, you're rewarded for being quite competitive, it seems. And of course, that's not a, that's not a particularly kind uh, ethos, really. Um, and so anybody uh, 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 thinking about reaching out for help is, is going to have to face the fact that they're vulnerable and then possibly not a good competitor. And so, you know, the whole ethos of, of, of society around us probably inhibits our ability to, to, to reach out for help. I wonder what, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I think, um, I think, yeah, being in that competitive um, mindset and um, uh, environment, um, it, it's definitely not being kind on yourself at all. Um, I think, you know, it can have real drastic um, measures that develop mentally as well. You know, it's exhausting and draining. And, you know, I guess it's that, it's also finding that way of like um, being perfect as well. Um, and always, and then also if you're being competing, competing, sorry, um, it means that you're always comparing yourself to someone else because you're competing either against someone else or you're competing against yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, competing against yourself is, is healthy um, to some degree, of course. Um, you know, you've got to have that balance. But competing against other people, I mean, it's never, it's, it's never really going to um, end well. Um, you know, you've got to be kind to yourself. We're all on our own journeys. We're all um, at our own pace. Um, you know, there's no rush to get things done. You know, I think, especially I think being in this... Um, you know, lockdown, I mean, we're really starting to, you know, well, we were stuck, we were starting to slow down and um, understand that, you know, just to like be and just to be in that present moment um, with yourself or with people around you. Um, and just to slow down, I think it helps so much for the mental health. Um, and yeah, like I said, I think competing with yourself is, is, is good, but also um, it can go to those drastic measurements of perfectionism and you know mm. what even is perfect where how do we even get to that state or where when will we even be happy you know like we get to that stage that we think we're at but then there's more or you know what's the next bit like where is it ever going to end you know so I, I think just accepting for where you are at this moment and who you are and what you're doing and where, how far you've come in life is is so important to always reflect on a demanding world isn't it and, and perfection is such a high standard to to set yourself against. Yeah, mm. it is. It is, um, and I think it's all it's just unachievable, really. Um, so we all have our own degrees of it, and then it will. I guess that will never be enough, really, either. Um, I think. Um, also, going back to your question um, of, you know, why. Um, why we find it difficult to seek um, help. Um, you did ask that question, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, you did. Okay. Why, why in society does it, but, but does, it, does it make it difficult for us to seek help? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think, so I think everyone will have their own, everyone will have their own um, experiences and that's really important to understand. Um, I think, something that I've learned from my experiences of seeking help or, um, you know, that, that one of the barriers that I faced, um, and that's something that I wish somebody had told me at the time was, so when I first started going to counseling and therapy sessions, um, I was, I was fortunate to have a great counselor to begin with. Um, and that was wonderful. And then, so I had some other counselors and therapists after that. Um, and, I didn't necessarily gel with them or I didn't get on with them. And to have that feeling of not gelling with that person or feeling like that person doesn't understand you or you just don't connect, um, it was really disheartening for me because you go into that state of an hour and you're very, you're very vulnerable. Um, and, you know, for them to not 
work with you um, on like an emotional or, you know, uh, on a therapist level um, can really be um, quite, yeah, disheartening. And, you know, for me, I've come away and been like, oh, well, what was the point in that? And I'm not going to try that again. Like, that sucks. Um, <laughs> um, and, you know, having a few more of those experiences and then also then finding a great therapist eventually, um, I learned that, you know, it's okay that you're not going to get on with every counsellor or every therapist that you go to. And I wish somebody had told me that to begin with. I wish somebody had told me that that's okay because they're a human being. They will, everyone will have their own way of being a therapist or their way, own way of dealing with, the, um, you know, working on those sessions with you because they've all had their own experiences. Um, and I've noticed that every counsellor and therapist is different in some form of way. And um, they bring their own thing to the table to help you. And if that doesn't work with you, that is okay. Um, and it, you know, that's no, it's no reflection on who you are or even who they are. It just means that you don't get on. Um, and it's like that with people in general, you know, we're not, we don't gel with everyone in life. Otherwise that would be boring. Um, so I, yes, something I really wish um, I got told earlier on because I also noticed growing up that a lot of my friends would go into their first counseling session and it would not go well. And then they would not proceed to carry on seeking help in other areas. And that can have, you know, very drastic negative effects on that person. Um, and, and I understand why, you know, what they feel after that session. But I think if someone was to just explain to them that, you know, it's okay if we don't get on, um, you know, but there'll be someone that you will find who you will get on with. And once you find that person, it's amazing. Um, and they build you up into a fantastic person. So, so the overall message, loud and clear, is shop around. Yes. And, and it's okay to say to your therapist, actually, this isn't working for me, you know, and they know that that's part of the, that's part of the business. Yeah. So move on until the chemistry works. Really. Exactly. Yeah, definitely shop yeah. around. <laughs> that's, and it's okay to shop around. <laughs> I mean, your, um, your background is counselling, so I'm sure, you know, have you, have you ever had anyone be like, this isn't working for me? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's great. So, and, and I always try and, uh, and set out that dynamic in the introductory session so you know and, and, and test towards the end of the introductory session how that how they feel that chemistry is and help them find other people you know finding a counsellor can be a mystifying business because you have to learn a whole terminology and um, it feels like in order to be able to, to, to find help and so you know one of the things you can do is help demystify that and signpost other people who are working in the area. That's and wonderful. I'll do that for you, you know, or for me. So it, it, what goes around comes around. So don't worry about saying this isn't good enough and, and, and move on. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's um, wonderful. Wish I had you as my counsellor <laughs> back a <laughs> long ago. <laughs> um, well, obviously, we, we now have a pre-existing relationship, so we can't do that. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway. That's great to hear that, though. Good. Um, we, we're on the subject of kindness, I suppose, by, by, by definition. Um, and kindness is the, the topic of Mental Health uh, Awareness Week. What are your feelings about how, the act, how acts of kindness have helped you with your recovery? So um, for my PTSD recovery, um, when I was in my final year at university, um, I, had, um, uh, I had a very supportive network around me. And um, my, yeah, my story for kindness is basically, um, when, I was, when I was in that final year, um, I, like I said before, you know, all of those racing of the flashbacks and hypervigilance and night terrors and stuff um I was you know I was always in my university room and you know it's a tiny little room <laughs> um and it's, it's very easy to just like be in the thoughts all the time um and it got to a point where um I had I had told my parents what had happened um which in itself was um a very big step to do I mean to say to explain to them what happened um and um I basically called up my mum one day um, 
and I asked her I was like can you just are you able to come to my come to um where I'm living um so I was living in London and she was in Somerset a bit of a drive I asked her to just come up and stay with me and um, just spend a few days with me because I needed somebody in that space with me you know in that little room with me um to um take me away from all of those negative thought patterns that I was having in within me um and I it was a very like a last minute thing you know asking her to come up because I needed her like instantly um and I felt really bad because my mum had lost a dear friend at that point and that weekend that I would like would wanted her to come up was the funeral for um her friend so it meant that if she was to come up to be with me that means that she's going to miss saying goodbye to her dear friend and I felt really bad for that you know I I I I didn't want her to come up but so she could go but at the same time I was like I need my mum like that's who I need to be with me um and so she came up um instead of going to the funeral and I was extremely grateful for that and basically what we did was um we we just spent like a few days of just doing normal things like um normally I would be either racing around with my university work trying to drastically finish it or I'd be processing the trauma so for her to take me out of that um environment that I was in into a normal as you were um daily you know not thinking about too much environment what we did was we just went window shopping on Oxford Street we went and had lunch um you know we weren't you know we weren't going and buying anything we were just like looking at things and just having like general conversation about just things or maybe what we were looking at um, or even sometimes not even having a conversation, you know, like I was very comfortable with my mum. So sometimes I just wouldn't even want to be making conversation, but to take me out of that unhealthy environment and place me into a more stable one, I suppose, as you were, a bit more uh, lifelike. um, It it just changed so much for me, you know, it it really... um, helped me in that moment you know and also she was just there to sit with me to sit with my emotions to um you know realize that I'm going through something horrendous but to not ask too many questions to not ask much about what had happened um just to allow me to process the emotions that I was feeling and to just be there with me was just so beneficial um and you know, I suppose the message I'm trying to get out here is that, you know, you just never know what someone's going through. You know, if, if, if you know someone's going through a hard time, what I would recommend anyway is to ask them what they need from you because everyone will need something different. And to just know that you're there to listen, to not have any prejudgment, to not ask any questions. It's just so beneficial because it's them unloading this massive weight that they're carrying around with them 24 um, seven. And to know that they're not alone and they can just go to someone um, is just so, so, so important. Um, and I also had something else happen um, within all of that mist that I, um, I actually opened up to a friend who um, came up and saw me for a couple of days and um, I, she was a friend that I was close with, but we didn't really like spend, we didn't spend like lots of like physical time together because she lived quite far away. So when she came up, I, um, I was really nervous because I was like, well, I'm not in my constant great mental state. So I was like, I'm going to have to tell her briefly what happened. So she's understanding that there's nothing that she's done or I've done, you know, um, so I told her what had happened and um, I was really scared to tell her because I wasn't 100% sure how she was going to react. Um, and when I told her, she actually ended up telling me something that happened to her and it was a very similar incident. So she understood what I was going through, but I would never have guessed that unless I had said it to her. Um, and it just opened up. A whole other world you know to un- to realize that there's someone else out there that understands what I'm going through was just like it was just so beneficial I mean I I was so grateful for the support I had around me with my friends and my mum there to support me through what I was going through however they 
they didn't understand to an extent what it was because they hadn't experienced it themselves, which is okay. I wouldn't ever want someone to experience what I'd experienced. But to then find someone who had gone through something so similar, it just created that whole different dynamic. You know, it was like when I knew that I was able to go and talk to her if something had happened, like a flashback, and maybe she would also have um, some form of um, advice or tips to give me that helps her, um, which is just so, so important. Um, so I, another message I'm trying to get out there is that I understand that it's so hard to open up to people, but if you are able to find at least one person to open up to, it does so much for you. Um, and it might even do something for them too, you know? I, th I think in a way as well, to know that she, to, for her to know that I had gone through something similar helped her in a way as well. So we were helping each other. Um, and yeah, you, yeah, you just really just don't know what someone's going through until you start talking. And I do think talking is the best therapy. Absolutely. And then other things I take from, from your story is that uh, an act of kindness and helping can be really quite a simple thing. It can just be physically being with a person. It doesn't have to involve, you know, uh, a high uh, technique, or, 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 or complicated uh, um, things to do. Um, and, uh, and, and giving you priority seemed to be a really important thing too. What your mother did uh, seemed to, to set aside her concerns and the other things in her life. So making you, making you a priority was really a, a, an important thing. Yeah. And, 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 and when you open up to somebody, you may find that there's a shared experience there, and that's really powerful. It often makes real, really immediate bonds between people, in my experience. Yeah, completely. I mean, I, we, were, we were good friends anyway, but when that happened, I was like, wow, like, yeah, you just, that a bond becomes even more precious um, and more powerful, like you said. So we are, we're 45 minutes into our session now i wonder whether it's a good time for us to uh, see what's what's in the chat shall we have a look and see um uh, what people if people have got any questions yeah sure yeah let's have a look have you been uh, keeping an eye on it persephone have you got some some particular We've got here uh, a comfortable silence. This is from Eleanor. Comfortable silence can be a lovely thing. And she said, I'm so proud of you, Sarah, for being so courageous. She said, oh, nice to let thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and Steve Loft says, aside from being an empathetic listening ear, there are other ways we can support others affected by anxiety and PTSD. I wonder if Steve wants to uh, expand on that, if, if we've got time. I've, I've missed the question mark out, I'm sorry. The question ah. is, are there other ways we can support others affected by anxiety and PS, PTSD, aside from uh, listening and empathetic ear? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think uh, I put this across to, um, uh, to Sarah first. I'll, I've certainly got a view, but Sarah, what, what are your opinions about other forms of, uh, uh, of, of treatment, of other forms of, of, of things that are, that are useful to people with anxiety and PTSD? Hmm. Um, I think, um, well, I suppose for the PTSD, for me anyway, was um, so yeah, I, I do open up to people, but also <laughs> I don't, um, you know, it's hard. Um, so there are times when I don't open up. So I think for someone to just kind of message, like, you know, maybe once a week or every other day, if they know that that person's struggling, to just send that first message to be like, how are you, you know, um, hi, I'm still here, you know, just to make that initial contact um, uh, could be so valuable because, you know, a lot of people don't like opening up but if someone comes to you first and is asking how you are also to ask twice as well this is something for me anyway 
someone asked me how I am I'm like yeah I'm fine and then someone was like but how are you really and then I'm like well <laughs> so yeah to ask twice um is so important um because we all of us tend to go on this autopilot and we're like yeah we're fine you know whatever um but yeah to ask twice um can not only get that person to start thinking like oh yeah yeah this is actually going on um it can yeah it can really break down that initial barrier for someone to start talking um i found also for um my general like anxiety and ptsd coming together is um to for me anyway i mean like going out into nature and just stepping outside <laughs> stepping outside my house for a little bit it, it changes so much for me um and maybe if someone was there to remind me sometimes <laughs> to like you know maybe you should go outside or you know go spend some time with green nature and some animals you know people who aren't human um and to be around off your phone um you know those gentle small little reminders i suppose if there are certain things you know that helps them daily or something that they like to do to give them that little reminder of being like oh why don't you try this or why don't you go outside for a little walk for a little bit um it could yeah it could really help them um yeah yeah and from my point point of view i think the first point i'd make is that um uh, anxiety is a thing you know, but it's quite quite often the case that people go through life uh thinking that anxiety is just a part of human existence but anxiety can be completely debilitating and so to recognize you know that it's an illness and to go and seek help to begin with yeah 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 and, and i agree I, I i'd also build a little bit on on your point about nature i think you know creativity nature these that these are these are really nurturing things there's a thing called the Five ways to well-being, which is a, it's quite a prevalent set of ideas now. Um, but they're, they're a set of five factors that are proven as good evidence base to have these things in in your life. Can I remember them? They're things like connecting to people, learning, take notice of things, uh, be active. I can always remember four out of five, and it's a different one that I forget every time. But but in, in essence, you know, use Mr. Google, look at the five ways to well-being, do a little bit of a life audit and find out what's in your life and what's maybe not in your life by inference and see if you can add something to make your life you know, richer and more nurturing. Mm. Yeah. And I think if, if we're going to talk about PTSD, I think we're in the territory of getting professional help, really, aren't we? Yeah. I Yeah. So I like to just add on to that, actually. It, um yeah, to um, maybe, I suppose for PTSD or any any mental health condition, if you know someone who has a form of mental health condition, is to start researching yourself to get a bit of an understanding of what it is, um, maybe how it might have developed, or and then also um, finding out ways that you know um, certain websites can give suggestions for someone to help that person um, but I, I honestly think that just someone having like a general idea of what it is um, and what are the symptoms um, is so beneficial because then it also shows from the other person who's suffering is like oh this person is wanting to understand you know they might not have understood before but they're, they're taking that time to educate themselves and to really understand why that person's suffering or you know what they can do to help um, and but yeah I fully understand I fully um, agree with Tony on like um, also trying to figure out way, where places where they could go to seek help. So, I mean, for PTSD, I mean, there's lots of different therapies out there that someone can have. There's group therapy, there's one-to-one -one therapy, there's lots of different therapies within the therapies. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's hubs and stuff all around the country for certain counties and stuff. So that's always a good place to look at. I think there's an app called Hub of Hope, um, which um, if people don't know it, they should really get to know it because what you can do is you can type in the location of where that person is and then it will come up and it will explain what, um, I think this is what it is, it will explain where um, uh, the hubs are someone can go to to seek help for that certain mental health condition. That's really great. Pardon? Hub of Hope. Yeah, Hub of Hope. 
um, a, a, a signposting the value of that 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 product. Yeah, um, I've seen that in the chat uh, from Fabian. Do you ever find that you stigmatise yourself? And uh, he says that he knows he's done that in the past. And yes, I'd I'd, I'd echo that as well as uh, a receiving stigma from other people, um, either directly or you know. Uh, uh, vicariously as you describe it's certainly possible to to stigmatize yourself you know and uh, 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 things like guilt and shame uh, are, are really really poisonous things to uh, uh, to take inside you and they often come with that uh, the process of uh, stigmatizing yourself so yes that's that can that can be a thing and Steve Loft says the last of the five ways to well-being uh, is uh, is giving and he says, we're doing that today, yes. And giving is good for other people and it's good for you too. It's a great, it feels really good thing to do. Um, and Prakash says, what do you want others to get out of your authentic loving share? Uh, what do we want other people to get? I think we've been uh, really... Um, uh, uh, announcing some some things during the course of this, haven't we? One way or another, we're saying you know, reach out, talk to people, um, get help. Um, that um, uh, help can be quite a quite a, a, a simple thing. Um, and uh, and shop around to therapists. We yeah. saying that. Um, yeah. You know, the, uh, own, owning your own recovery and reaching out to others to help you. Mm. Uh, and other people will want to help you, I think, has been my experience. What, 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 what are your perspectives on that, Sarah? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, I think, um, it's, I suppose something that I've been doing recently for my mental health is... Um, doing like gratitude lists as well. I mean, they, they've been really helping me for my anxiety and my PTSD. And also just the, like the world, like the current events that are going on at the moment. And I've, I've noticed when I've been doing these gratitude lists, so a gratitude list is when you're like, when you write something down and what you're grateful for for that day. And I've noticed that those things that I'm being really grateful for are very simple, well, not simple things, but you know, it doesn't involve like materialistic things. It doesn't involve your phone or it doesn't involve um, you know something that you've just bought it involves the people around you um it, it it involves for me anyway it tends to involve like you know the nature and everything like that it's very it's things that have always been around you um but i think it's taking that um understanding and realizing how appreciative you are of those things and realizing how your world would be so different if they weren't there Mm. Um, and so that's been helping me a lot with my anxiety anyway, um, is to really be in that present moment and to appreciate that. Well, yeah, when you're in that present moment, you are then more appreciative of what is around you, um, instead of what's going to be happening in the future or what's been happening in the past. Do you think that um, helps you internalize that, that, that something? And, and if so, what is that? What, sorry. Do you, what did do you, you think that you know you were talking about making a list of the things that that, that you appreciate? That, does that help you internalise that? How does that how does that how does that work? Do you do you have a feeling for that? Um, I don't know if I've got a feeling for it, but um, maybe there's like several or combined into one. <laughs> um, but I I think I think it, it's just really making me appreciate the the things that are around me the things that are most important um and I think it's very easy to dismiss that on a daily basis when we're cluttered with all of this um you know social media and mm. um you know work and all those pressures um when really at the end of the day yes those things matter of course they do but we should also be appreciating the people that are around us and um, you know, the fact that we are currently healthy and, um, you know, everything like that. It, it just ground, it's been really grounding me a lot um, to this present moment because for me anyway, I'm always in the future um, or I'm never really quite accepting what's happened in the past. I'm always like 
nitpicking at that. So to just literally just be in the present moment, it's, it's grounding me, it's accepting, it's the acceptance again of who I am and what I am. Um, and it's just making me really grateful for things. Um, I just, yeah, I just think it's the little things really that make the most biggest impact. You know, if we didn't have them, then um, yeah, it would be quite difficult to survive daily. So it's a conscious process. It's consciously being aware of those things. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And what else have we got? Mm-hmm. Oh, we, I think we've answered Steve's question. How is Sarah kind to herself now? Unless you've got other things to bring. Um, and Persephone has posted Hub of Hope in the chat. Oh, great. Thank you, Persephone. Okay. Okay, I think we've probably covered. Uh, Prakash has said, allowing yourself to reconnect with the simple things in life has helped me. So there's an echo there. Yeah, I think we've we've more or less dealt with uh, the things that we find in in the chat. So I think it's probably time for us to thank uh, Sarah for sharing in uh, uh, the traditional way. So. I wonder if we can all unmute ourselves so that we can make that audible. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Emperor. Yeah. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Tony, as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um. So we're always looking for more time to change Kingston champions to get involved. So a bit of a plug at the end. So if you're interested in reducing stigma in Kingston through events, activities, and particularly at the moment, online campaigns, then please get in touch with Persephone, our time to change hub coordinator by emailing, sorry, this is gonna be a really long email address, persephone at healthwatchkingston.org.uk or by clicking the link provided in the chat. You can be involved as much or as little as you want, and I found it inspiring. People are powerful things, they have a lot of resources, and they've got a lot of ideas to offer, and it's all too easy to forget that. So, thanks everyone, and uh, have a good rest of your day.